on right now because I know uh, Brian, who's usually the one, you know, the one reminding me, you know, asking me whether the recorder is on or not. Yeah. <coughs> he ha he cannot make it in the afternoon class. He was in my in the morning class, but he just cannot make it today in the afternoon. So I have to check my own recording things. All right. So let me look up the right tab here. Give me a second. Did you guys take a look at the grade distribution, the score distribution? A little? Okay. I'm going to show it, okay? So because I, I found it to be <clears throat> different classes are different, and I mean very different. So for this class, okay, let me just kind of show that chart. Um, announcement. It's the latest announcement. It's the exam two score grade distribution. All right, so on the left-hand side, you can you see the uh, the actual score uh, distribution. So every single point is a student, and I sort the grade you know in increasing order. So that's why it plot like this. So what you're seeing is you know of the top four scores or the top five scores, they are up here. So basically, you know about four people get about the same score, and then one person got, I would say another. Point three, you know, up, you know, on top of the other three people, and then you can see that this is a pretty linear curve. I have, I usually do not see linear curve like this. You know, the other classes that I teach you know, sometimes has really kind of, you know, it looks like a bell curve, especially on this side when you look at the grade distribution. This is not bad by my standard, um, but for people who are kind of down here, you know, with a D and an F. You know, uh, the final exam can be particularly important, you know, just to make sure that you <clears throat> pass the class as a whole. So are there any questions about the graphs? The first one is, you know, the score graph, and the second one is the grade distribution graph. Why is it the score? Hmm? Yeah. Um, because typically I get more people in the middle, which means you, you see a flatter curve in the middle here. And then you see a sharp curve at the end, and then usually a pretty sharp curve at the bottom too. So, yeah, yeah, because with the normal distribution, you have you know, fewer people in the D and the F, and then you you have more people in the C, and then then fewer people in the B and the A again. So this one is not exactly following that curve. Um, yeah. You mean this one? Yeah, so this one tells us eight people got an A. You know, if you just look at exam two and using the uh, boundary you know, in the syllabus, after adjustment, uh, we have eight people getting A's, nine people getting B's, nine people getting C's, five people getting C's, and two people getting F's. Yeah. Yes, I am. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> I like him. I, I, just, I just like him. <clears throat> um, yeah, go ahead. Right. Um, all right, so I'm going to give you a very annoying answer. Is It is all in the syllabus. <laughs> yeah, 62.5% is the lower bound. Yep. Yeah, so 62.5% is the starting point of a B up to but excluding 87.5 percent because that's the starting point of A's. Um, yep. Um, hard to say. I mean, it's not entirely entirely linear because you can see it there's still a little bit of a shape of a curve. Um, except it's kind of skewed to the side of the A, so I don't think anyone can really complain about the, the shape of the curve. Because if it's on the other side, then I think more, more people would be concerned. It's like, how is that possible? You know, most of the class is not making it. So um, this, is not, this is not bad, but it's fairly typical for 440. 310 has a different shape, you know. Huh? Um, sure. 
So let me and the two three ten sections, you know, the Tuesday Thursday versus the Monday Friday, Friday Monday Wednesday class are different as well. So that is the part that is kind of amazing, you know, that I cannot explain. Okay, uh, they get the same test. They have the same material. I covered the same material and. No, because you know, they are still taught slightly differently. Yeah. Um, so I can, I you know, I do not want to combine those. So for each class, I would choose the top, um, the third highest score because those are smaller classes compared to this one. This class has thirty-two people, and those two classes only have like twenty-two, twenty-three. So that's why you know the uh, the top score is different. You know where I get quote unquote the normal. Um, let me uh, let me put this window over on that side. Give me a second. Is there a pattern like the the, the, the later class like usually do better? Um, I'm not I'm sure. I haven't. Sure. I haven't <laughs> looked at. A certain time of day. I think the time of the day may have something to do with it. Yeah. Um, and where is that? Oh, right here. All right, so this is my, let me see, this is my, oh, I cannot see which class this is. I think this is my Tuesday, Thursday class. So this is not even a bell curve, right? And you can see how, you know, there's a flat line here. The flatter the line, the more people are concentrating around that score. When you see a sharp curve like this, that means, you know, we have very few people in between. So it's a very, you know, quick change you know, of the score. So you can see how this distribution is very different from you know, the, 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 distribution, the, the distribution of 440. Um, so with this one, you know, there are more people getting Ds and Fs than there are people getting As and Bs, unfortunately. So the, it's not a very symmetric you know, um, curve. But with assembly language programming, the way I teach it, you know, at this point of the semester, it really boils down to either people get it or they don't. Um, you know, and you know, there are some people here who took the 310 from me, so they know that you know it's it's a very um, the dependency is is a lot more linear than this class. So in this class, you know, we talk about a lot of things that are kind of they are related, but they are not like super related. You don't have to ace one particular concept to kind of move on to the next one. But in 310, that is the case. So when people start to fall behind, then it really start to, you know, the, the grades start to get affected. It is not to the point where it cannot be recovered. I have seen people recovering, you know, in 310, but it takes a lot of effort to do that. Yep. Okay, but but that sends a message, you know, then you and then you you know, step up your effort, right? You step up your effort in your final exam. <clears throat> because technically speaking, if people are just you know aiming for the C, you can ace the final exam and pff, you're done. You you get your C, because you know, the final exam is forty percent of all the score, and you only need thirty seven point five percent to get a C you know out of the class. So that means you know someone can totally wait until the final exam and just ace it, and get out of the class with a passing grade. Now, don't see it as a challenge. <laughs> I'm not trying to challenge this class and go like, yeah, go ahead and try that. You know, <clears throat> I will be one of those few people where I can ace the final exam. So there we go. So I'm gonna put this one back into the on the other side because it's not exactly this class. So I'm gonna put it back to the the monitor that you cannot see. All right. So what we'll do is we're gonna take a look at the exam from spring semester, spring 2023. 20, uh, so I'll go ahead and get one of those file. Oh, that's previous semester, um, fx-000 dot pdf. There we go, okay. So this is one of the many variations you know, of that test. Um, some of these will still apply to you, okay? So if you look at the instructions, most of that will still apply. 
Um, obviously, the date and the time will be different. The duration is the same, so we still have a two-hour final exam. The questions are randomized. Do not assume any one-to-one -one correspondence with exams from past semesters. You can use any material that is printed or handwritten on the exam, on paper prior to the exam. So you can print, you can handwrite, you know, same usual stuff as exam one and exam two. Answers should have explanation of reasoning, and you know this is a explanation of what reasoning means. It is step by step, logically linking a question asked you know, to what the question is asking to concepts that we have introduced in my class. You know the modules or lecture content, and consequently derive you know the the answer. So you know things have to be connected. Okay, I have to see how you make all those connections. <clears throat> you can use a calculator. Graphing calculators are fine. Uh, scoring criteria. You know uh, statements relating a question to concepts introduced in the class in a logical way, logically applying concepts. Blah 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 blah. So you guys can read that. I will send this to you. Um, in a multi-part question, the score of an earlier part can limit the score of the later part. Okay, so this is what I'm using to also grade exam two. What that means is, let's say you know a question has parts A, B, C, D, E. Okay, there are five parts to it. Uh, some people can get part A all done correctly, part B all done correctly, part C is partial. So if part D depends on part C. That means you know, even if part C is 100% consistent with what part C has, which is wrong to begin with, the score for part D can only be as high as part C. Okay, the rationale behind that is I can see how me myself can abuse you know the partial credit thing and know that I have no idea what the answer to this thing is and then make up. A answer for that part, knowing that I can now derive everything after that and get full points for all of those. So, so this whole thing about dependency you know, is basically to make sure that you know people like myself, not you, but myself, cannot abuse the partial credit system. <clears throat> so that's why you know, we have that criteria. Uh, all questions carry the same weight, which I intend to keep as well. So that means. After you get the exam, the first thing you want to do is to go over every single question quickly first. Okay, find out which one you feel the most comfortable with, and then start with that one. And then you also want to time yourself. Okay, so let's just say that it's a two-hour exam and there are four questions. So what you want to do is to divide two hours by four. So you have 120 minutes divided by four. You have 30 minutes, and you don't want to time yourself to have 30 minutes per question. Shrink it a little bit, okay? Give yourself 20, 25 minutes per question. When that time is up, no matter where you are, move on to the next question. So this way, you have a chance to answer every single question at least a little bit, okay? When you have time after that, because of the timing that I suggest, there should be about 10 minutes you're left you're behind. So then you can go back to the questions where you did not quite finish entirely, and then go back and try to answer those questions. So that's what I suggest because in your first assessment of the difficulty of the questions, it may not be 100% correct, which means something that you thought was easy may not be as easy as it seemed to be you know, in, in at first glance. So if you do it this way, you have a chance to answer every single question. So one question that you thought is really hard may turn out to be really easy. So now you can get to that question, answer that one completely without you know. Because if you do it the other way, okay, you answer every single one question entirely, then move on to the next one, you may not get a chance to answer some of the other questions. That may turn out to be easy, and you actually can answer 100%. So does that make sense? Okay. So it's just a strategy that I suggest. Okay, you guys are obviously free to use whatever strategy that you feel like. All right, so we are moving on to the actual questions. All right, so the first question <clears throat> says you know, a bureau of gambling control, a bureau of gambling control agent, so somebody you know, who's an agent, suspects a coin flipping game table in the casino is using a loaded coin. Okay, each game involves your know, five coin flips. 
While it is convenient just to log the outcome of every coin flip, it is too obvious, and the agent will have the cover blown. Because in that case, you know, you're going to have someone to go like, okay, it's a head, it's a tail, it's a head, it's a head, it's a tail, and so on. So you know, you cannot be too obvious when you go to casinos and do these things. So instead, the agent decides to track two counters. One counter simply tracks the number of games administered per day. Okay, so you know, it's just keeping track of you know how many games a particular table has administered you know on that particular day. The other counter tracks the number of games where two out of five flips end up with heads. So that's very specific. Okay, so head, head, tail, tail, tail increments the counter. Tail, I mean tail, head, tail, head, tail would increment the counter. Head, head, tail, tail, head would not increment the counter. So this means you know you don't have to count every single coin flip, which is too obvious. This way, you know, it's an easier. Um, you know, the agent can just keep two little counter in the pocket and just click it. You know, when he, when the agent sees a game with two heads and you know um, uh, two heads and three tails out of five flips. <clears throat> At the end of the day, the agent counted that there was a total of 200 games administered, of which 69 ends up with two heads. You may assume the agent's observation is consistent with the actual characteristic of the coin, which means you know just assume that these are truly representing the probability that you should be seeing. All right, so there are multiple parts. Okay, part one, part two, and part three. Part one is only worth 10 percent. Based on the observation, what are the chances x that so the x is the variable describing the chances that the game ends up with two heads and three tails? All right. So what what do you think? That's because it's only 10 percent. So you can probably anticipate the answer is fairly simple. Mm -hmm. How do you compute it? What is the actual way to compute? What are the chances that a particular game, out of five flips, that you end up with two heads and three tails? Based on the observation, okay? So look at the observation made by the agent. 200 games observed, 69 end up with two heads. So from that, how do you, you know, kind of figure out the probability of a game you know, ending up with two heads and three tails? You go like, Two heads and three tails, isn't that the same thing as two heads out of five flips? The answer is yes. So what, what do you think is the probability? 69 divided by 200. Yep, that's it. Okay, so that's the answer to part one is 69 divided by 200. Um, then part two is asking, considering one single game as an experiment, okay? So now you have to remember, what is an experiment? Because in this case, the term experiment is not the general definition experiment. This is describing um, discrete probability kind of experiment. So if you look at each single game, five flips, as an experiment, describe the following. So I broke this up into tiny little portions so that you can answer each one individually. And hopefully that will lead you to what you need in order to solve part three. So we'll address these you know, one at a time. How many trials do we have per experiment? So now you have to remember, what is a trial? What is an experiment when we are considering the binomial distribution in this case? But you don't even have to know that this is a binomial distribution at this point. If, it is a, if this is an experiment, how many trials do we have? Five trials, very good, okay? So because each trial is something, is an action that has multiple possible outcomes, and then you should know, you know, what possible outcomes, you know, can come out of each trial. In this case, each trial can either end up with a head or a tail. And there are five trials in each experiment, okay? So are we good so far? All right, so moving on to the next one, what are the outcomes of the first trial? A head or a tail, right? Head or tail from the first trial. Are the possible outcomes per trial with or without replacement? In other words, in the second trial, can we still end up with a head or a tail? Yes, okay, all right, so this is with replacement, okay? Without replacement means 
you know, the, the outcome of the first trial or an earlier trial is no longer available to the later trials. Is that okay so far? Okay. And then the next one says, you know, is the positioning of the specific outcome of each trial significant? In other words, uh, we know that we are looking for two heads and three tails, but the question is, does it matter whether we have two heads and then three tails, or does it matter that we have one head, one tail, one head, and then two tails? Does that make a difference? The answer is they do not make a difference, okay? So positioning does not make a difference. Describe the outcome set omega of an experiment. So this means it'll tell me <clears throat> as a set, okay, what does omega look like? Okay. So if it's combination, it's not too hard to describe, right? Because when it comes to combination, you describe it as a set, or you can describe it as you know, how many heads and how many tails. So there are only six possible outcomes in this case if you're counting the number of combinations. Zero head, five tails. One head, four tails. Two head, three tails. Three head, two tails. Four heads, one tails. Five head, zero tails. So there are only six elements in omega because ordering is not important. Now, if ordering is important, then you have two to the power of five, which is 32 outcomes in that case. Okay? Describe the event set E of the experiment. So, so there are two possible answers to these two parts. If you answer omega with the 32 permutations, which means your know, head, head, tail, tail, tail is one element, and then head, tail, head, tail, tail is another element, then you know, E is going to have you know, multiple elements. But otherwise, you know, the set E only has you know, one single element. What kind of distribution model, um, what kind of distribution models the occurrence probability of elements in E. In other words, if I only want to look at how often, what are the chances that you know, a particular element of E is gonna, is the result of the entire experiment, what would that be? What, what is the distribution model in this case? So this question, the last question, is relying on everything that you have worked up up to here. So what do we know at this point? We know that um, the number of outcomes per trial is head or tail. And it doesn't change, okay? You know, in other words, it is with replacement. Is that okay? Okay. So immediately, you are thinking about two, right? Head or tail. And it's always just head or tail per trial. So what would that remind you, like, kind of hopefully right away? So you think about all the problems that we have solved, okay, when we talked about discrete probability, what type of distribution or what type of probability problem has the nature of there are two outcomes per trial with replacement? Binomial. binomial distribution, yep. So binomial distribution is going to be the last part. Is that okay? Um, lotto tickets. The lotto ticket is basically the other one. Uh, the birthday problem is a part of the lotto issue problem because those are all without replacement. And uh, what's, how would you describe, like, what would you describe um, They don't have a specific name. Yep. Mm hmm. Huh? You can say lotto. Yep. You know, the lotto kind of you know, probability calculation. Yep. Second to the last one, this one. Um, so it depends. If your omega is um, the all the permutations, then this one is going to be all the permutations that end up with two heads. In other words, okay, let me, let me try to be uh, more specific. I'm going to write it out. 
it's easier to write this than to um, hand, it's easier to type than it is to handwrite, which is what I'm going to do here. I'm going to open up a regular text editor, <clears throat> drag it to here. All right, so omega is a set, okay? So that's the first thing is you have to indicate that it is a set. So there are two ways to look at this. The first way to look at this is to look at it from the permutation perspective. Then you can have head, head, okay, I'm just gonna use h, 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 okay? And then you have h, 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 t, h, 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 t, h, 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 t, h, h. So this is gonna be long. There, there will be 32 of these, okay? And the last one, according to this pattern, is gonna be tail, 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 tail. So if this is omega, then the event set is going to be the ones that we are interested in, which are the ones that end up with two heads and three tails. So that's gonna be h, h, t, 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 h, uh, h, t, h, t, t, h, t, t, h, t, h, t, 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 h, and then we have t, h, h, t, t, and so on. So the question is, how many elements are you expecting in the event set? How do you calculate that? T, T, H, T, H, H. All right, so, so I think we have a sub-problem that, that I need to explain here. So the sub-problem that I need to explain is what is the cardinality of omega? 32. 32, right, exactly, because we got five places and each place can have either head or tail. So you can visualize a tree, okay, where every time you branch from a node, it's either head or tail. So there, so the fan out is two, and then there are five. It's five level, five levels deep because each time you branch out is is representing a trial. So that we that's why we have thirty two uh, elements in omega. What about the cardinality of the event? How do we look at that problem? It will be five choose two. Okay, so why is it five choose two? Okay. That is a, that's a good explain. it's a good starting point, okay? But Why is it not permutation of 5, 2? Instead, it has to be combination 5, 2. <clears throat> okay, so I'm, I'm hoping you guys remember the other way to look at this one is to say, oh, the positioning of the head is 0, 1 in this case, you know, assuming it's 0 oriented. And in this one, the head position is 0, 2. In this case, you know, the head positions are 0, 3. And then zero four, and the next one, <clears throat> and then this one is going to be one two. Okay, do you guys remember this? You know how we encode. You know, instead of looking at the where the heads and the tails are, we encode the positioning of only the heads. Do you vaguely remember this? This would be three four because we are zero oriented. Do you guys remember this? I hope so. Okay. So what does that look like to you? It looks like we have four, we have five numbers in a bag. They're numbered zero, one, two, three, four. And we are trying to draw two pieces of paper out of the bag. And we're asking how many ways can we draw two pieces of paper out of the bag that has five pieces of paper in it. And those five pieces of paper are numbered from zero to four. Is that okay? Does that seem does it ring a bell? Huh? So that means it's five choose four because in that case we are we don't care. We can pick the four out of the bag first and then we choose the three out of the bag. That's fine. It's it is still describing the same outcome from the experiment. Is that okay? So I'm I'm hoping that is making some connection. Okay, just imagine, okay, just imagine that you have a bag, okay, and the, in the bag we have five marbles and they're labeled zero, one, two, three, four. 
So to get to the event set, we are really asking with that original bag of five marbles, how many ways can you draw two marbles out of the bag? And that becomes, but ordering is not important in that case because you know if you draw three and then four versus when you draw four and then three, it does not matter because these are sets, they're not tuples. If they were tuples, then the ordering would have been important. But since these are sets, which means, hey, you know, as long as three is chosen and four is chosen, I don't care which one is chosen first. So now we are looking at the number of combinations where the bag originally has five marbles and we are choosing two, so it's five choose two. It's the combin five two, which is five factorial divided by two factorial times three factorial. The product is the denominator. So, getting back to the, getting back to the cardinality, what is the cardinality of the event set? <clears throat> I just said. Okay, and how do we how do we figure this out without a calculator? Right. Okay, so um, we can do this by hand. Five factorial is. Come on, you guys can do this. What is five times four times three times two times one? 120, very good. <clears throat> and then divided by the product between three factorial and two factorial. What is three factorial? Three times two times one is six. Very good, okay. And what about two factorial, which is two times one? Just two, okay. So now we know that there are 10 of these things. <clears throat> All right, is that okay? All right. And then, uh, sorry. If yeah. You, if you treated the uh, omega set as a set of sets instead of a set of tuples, mm -hmm. uh, so then you can do that. Yeah, so then that would just be that for the. Um, so in this case, it would be, um, let's see. Yeah, so in this case, it would be um, because we're only counting the position of the heads, right? So this one would be a set of 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, because those are the positions of the heads. The next one will be coded as 0, 1, 2, 3, because the position 4 is a tail. And then the next one is going to be 0, 1, 2, 4. Because position number three is a tail. Um, yeah. You couldn't, the omega couldn't just be like uh, five heads, one tail, four heads. If you choose it that way, then your event set has to be matching accordingly. Okay. Yeah. The event set would just be. It would be just have one single element. Yep. Mm hmm. All right, because in this case, you know the um, the ratio between the um, e versus omega, you know the cardinality between e and omega is not the direct answer because this is a binomial distribution. So in a binomial distribution, it has its own way of calculating the probabilities. Okay, which is what part three is about. So part three is asking, explain, then derive an equation that can resolve the probability p. Of the of a coin, the coin, because we suspect a coin is loaded, <clears throat> landing heads up. An equation that only has p as the only unknown will suffice. So the key words here is it has to be an equation, which means it has to be in the form of blah blah equals to blah blah blah. Okay, has to be an equation, and in the equation we only have p as the only variable. Okay, because if you have an equation, you only have one single variable then it is resolvable. Now, is it gonna be a simple thing to resolve you know, al using algebra, or is it gonna be something that you need like a spreadsheet to approximate? Hey, we don't care, okay, as long as it re is resolvable. <clears throat> There's no need to actually resolve the value of P, okay? So that's very clear, okay? Do not attempt to resolve P because it, is, it may not be a very simple thing. Okay, so how would we answer part three in this case? 
So we look at all the pieces that we have at this point. We know, um, okay, the first one, which is the wrong answer is, oh, it's just going to be 69 divided by 200. That is not the right answer. Why is that not the right answer? I mean, 69 divided by 200 is representing a probability, but it's not the probability of a landing on the head. What is that probability? It's one of the subparts of part two. It's, it would be the probability of a game ending up with two heads and three tails. That is 69 divided by, divided by 200, okay? So now you look at this and go like, but this is a binomial distribution because by the time you get to this part here, we know this distribu distri uh, distribution is a binomial distribution. So what do you want to do? Once you know this is a binomial distribution and you brought along all your notes and all the modules printed out and all that stuff, what are you going to do? You look up what is the binomial distribution, right? You know, that seems natural to me. Is look up what is the binomial distribution and what does it look like? I might need to use my, well, I can always just look it up too. But what, what does the binomial distribution look like? Okay, I can, I can describe it in <clears throat> using just regular text, but it's not going to look as nice. Or I can just kind of go back to my notes to point out where or how we talked about that. Okay, so let me let me fire up the uh, <clears throat> the tablet, and then we'll we'll take a look at that. All right, four forty, new notepad. Okay, and this need to run the command line tool. Um, oh, okay. Um, has to do with the <clears throat> ordering of how things are connected. Okay, now it gives me that little notification. All right, so let's go ahead and review what is the binomial distribution. Okay, so assuming P is the probability, okay, P is the probability of landing on a head, okay? So now we want to look at the overall distribution. Okay, so we are looking at, you know, Q, okay, being defined as 1 minus P. That is the probability of hand landing on the tail. Is that okay? So P is the probability of landing on the head. Q, which is just 1 minus P, is the chances of landing on the tail. So binomial distribution says your P plus Q to the power of N, which is the number of trials, okay? How do we express that? So this is something that is in the notes, in the module, okay? And I keep reminding people to put all the definitions into one place. So that should be one place in your notes that has this particular definition. So we proved this theorem as well, okay? <clears throat> the binomial distribution theorem, you know, we proved that already. So what does that look like? Okay, it starts with a sigma. <laughs> so the question is, um, where is the, what is the range of I? It goes from zero to N, okay? And what is each item that we are adding in the binomial theorem, okay? So remember binomial theorem is when we, when I showed you guys how to use proof by induction. Okay, so I'm going to put it here, okay? So, but you should probably remember that too. So it's P to the power of I, Q to the power of N minus I. But that's not all, because we also have to multiply this by the coefficient. The coefficient is N choose I. 
And I think in the notes, I changed the positioning. It's n choose i times p to the power of i times q to the power of i minus 1. Okay, so I'm just going to pause here. Do you remember, do you vaguely remember the binomial theorem, which states that this is going to hold true no matter what n is? n only has to be a natural number. All right, so this is something that you need to kind of jot down and go like, okay, I need to review the binomial theorem and how it is proven, okay? Because the proof technique is also important. It's proved by induction. Okay, but we are not concerned about the proof technique in this case. We are, we are only looking at the binomial theorem and go like, how is that going to help me? Well, n turns out to be the number of trials, okay? And we already know the number of trials in this case is 5. Okay, very good. So now we just say, okay, <clears throat> we can make this more specific now. So we now know P plus Q to the power of 5 is sigma. I goes from 0 to 5. P to the power of I. Q to the power of N. Oh, 5 minus I. And this is 5 choose I. Okay. That is... A little helpful, but which specific i am I interested in? Two. Very good. So now we can say when i equals to two, <clears throat> then we end up with five choose two times p to the power of two, q to the power of three. But why is that important? Okay, this is one of the terms that we are adding, but what is this term representing? This is the probability of Hmm? Six, six, two head, three tails. This is the probability of ending up with two heads and three tails because p to the power of two is the probability of two heads. Q is the probability of one tail. So when it is to the power of three, it is the probability of three tails. The reason why we have five choose two is because there are 10 ways ending up with two heads and five tails, okay? So when you look at this entire term, it is describing the probability of a game, not a single toss, but an entire game ending up with two heads and three tails. Are we good so far? So this is in theory, okay? And you look at this equation and go like, but we're, what about Q, okay? Because we are only supposed to have P as a variable. Well, that's easy. <clears throat> if I choose two, p to the power of 2, 1 minus p to the power of 3, because that's how q is defined. So now we only have one variable in this expression. But it's not going to be helpful unless you can relate this to an actual number. So what is the observed probability of a game ending up with two heads and three tails? It's, a, it's, a, it's an earlier part of the exam question. Exactly. So this whole thing ends up as 69 divided by 200, and that's your answer. Now, obviously, you have to tell me the rationality of the reasoning along the way, but that is the final answer. In other words, the final answer that is worth, I think, 60% of the points is this part here. Now, the reasoning leading to the conclusion is also important, okay? But this is the end result. So it, you can resolve this, okay? You, you can actually use a spreadsheet or calculator to find out you know, what value of P will make this equality happen. But it's not something that's very simple to solve by hand, okay? Unless you really want to deal with <clears throat> something like this. Because we can end up with, um, P can end up with a power of five. You're, you're looking at a polynomial with your P to the power of five, P to the power of, Let's see what else. Um, P to the power of 2 is definitely one of those. And then, yeah, it's just a messy polynomial to solve. I'm not asking you to solve the polynomial itself. I just need you to present the equation so that we can leave it up to a spreadsheet to figure out the actual answer. Can you go back to the, uh, the, how the question started? Yes. Mm -hmm. Be like a, a system that relates to the idea of like 
Um, okay, so based on this part here, we know it is a binomial distribution. So if it is a binomial distribution, then we are looking at something like this. This is you know, from the binomial theorem. And then from the binomial theorem, you have to identify that this n is describing the number of trials. And that's why we can choose you know, n equal to 5. Out of this summation, then you have to identify this i needs to be a 2 to isolate the probability of two heads and three tails. So it is explaining all the way down to here. It's like, how did you, you know, get the n to 5? How did you get the i to be 2? And explain using words you know, how that relates to the whole pro how the problem is set up to begin with. Because n I, is the number of trials. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because the event set is only interested in two heads and three tails. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's where the two is coming from. Yep. But I didn't quite write it down, but I verbally described it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure. So is that okay? So. <clears throat> the point is, you know, the all these parts are really trying to help you. They're trying step by step to help you identify what kind of a probability problem is this. And then once you know the nature of the probability, then you look up the equation, right? And then you look up, you know, how do we isolate the one part that we need, and then equate that to the observed probability. So that's kind of you know how this question goes. All right. So I'm not expecting you guys to remember all of this stuff here because you know this is something that we talked about a few weeks back and you know we are not quite you know at the time of the final exam but this tells you what you need to study. You know the scope of this exam would include you know binomial distribution, the binomial theorem which is kind of important, um, proof by induction, those things are all kind of related to this question, even though I did not ask you in this case to prove by induction of something. All right, so next. <clears throat> so let's just say that I'm asking you a question about proof by induction. Okay, what kind of question you know, would it look like? And what do you need to do to get full credit for a question like that? So let's take a look at proof by induction okay so I'll give you an example okay so this is not in the previous exam but it is still in the scope of the final exam so you need to be prepared for this kind of question all right so I'm going to give you a recursive definition here I will say f of 0 is by definition 0 okay and then I'll give you a recursive definition of f of n is f of n minus 1 um, plus 2n minus 1. I think that works out. Let me, let me think about this. Okay. I think this works out. Okay. And I want you to show that, show that f of n is really n squared for all n in the set of natural numbers. Okay. So let's think about this as a potential question, which is obviously not going to happen because I'm not going to give you the same question in the final exam that I'm going to give you as a practice. But this is potentially the format of a question that will ask you about, can you show me how to prove something by induction? All right. So I know most of you have not studied proof by induction. So I'm just going to prompt you know, the question, but I'm not expecting you to know the answer because it's... It has been a while, has been a few weeks already since we talked about this. So proof by induction has two steps, has two distinct steps. The first one is the basis, the base case. So now you have to say the base case is when n equals to 0. So when n equals to 0, okay, f of n is f of 0, which is by definition 0. But 0 is also the same thing as 0 squared. So now we have established that you know, when n equals to 0, 
the theorem is true. Okay, so we can now say the theorem is true when n equals to zero. This is what we call the base case. Do you remember what is the next step in a proof by induction structure? It's the induction step. Okay, so now we have the induction step. So the induction step by itself has two parts. The first part is an assumption. The assumption says assume the theorem is true when <clears throat> n equals k. There are a few different variations of what you can do about the induction step, but I'm just going to use the most standard one, which is basically saying, don't ask me what k is, okay? I just can tell you that the theorem is known to be true when n equals to a particular, in this case, natural number k. So number two is now to say prove that <clears throat> the theorem is also true when <clears throat> n equals to k plus 1. So this is the key to proof by induction. You have a base case, and then in the induction step, you make an assumption that looks really weird. It's like, where does that k come from? Don't ask that question, okay? You're thinking a little bit too hard. We'll just say that assume that it is true for some, you know, for some k that is a natural number. Can we use that assumption to prove that the theorem is also true for the case when n equals to k plus 1? Okay? So in this case, this is an algebra thing. Okay? So let's see whether we can solve this problem. I'm running out of space on this page, so I'm just going to go all the way to the beginning. All right. So we are looking at f of k plus 1. And how, what is the next step? We are trying to resolve what is k plus 1. So we go with the definition of f, the function f, okay? Where is the definition of the function f? It's right here. We know that k plus 1 cannot be 0 because k is some kind of natural number. The lowest natural number is a 0, right? <laughs> and then 0 plus 1 is 1, which is not a 0. So that means we have to look at the recursive case. So the recursive definition says, okay, we'll just say, Okay, this is just f of k plus 2k plus minus 1. Is that okay? This is by the definition of function f itself. Are we good with that step? Okay. So here is the magical step. Okay, if you have to <clears throat> point to one single thing that is quote unquote magical about proof by induction, it is this particular step. It has to do with the application of the assumption in the induction step. In other words, what we're doing is we go back to this step here and go like, oh, so the assumption is the theorem is true when n equals to k, which means f of k is k squared. That is the theorem. This is the theorem itself. Yep. I think it's 2k minus 1. Huh? Oh, okay, right. Yep. Okay. I think so. I think you guys are right. Yeah, but you have to change both because this is the definition leading to this. So when it be factored in n equals k plus one, uh it would be saying two k plus two and minus one. Two k plus one. Right. And then two k minus one up there and then Oh right. Okay. Let's just go with this and then we'll fix that later. <laughs> because if I keep going like this, we'll find out that, oh, this is not working. Let's go back and change it. Okay. 
So the application of the uh, of the assumption is this is the theorem. Okay, the the actual theorem is this. This is our theorem. Okay. So if the theorem is true for the case when n equals to k, so that means you know oh f of k is really just k squared, and then we say plus two k, and then this is a minus one, and that is not k plus one squared because if you want a k plus one squared you need a plus one, not a minus one. So that means my original definition is wrong. So we need a plus one here and also a plus one here. Does that does that make sense? I need I need to change both at the same time, because the I need a plus one here, so that I can have k plus one squared. But that means I have to change the original definition too, because that's where it came from. Um, right. Okay. I okay. I get you now. So the minus one is actually correct here. But then, oh, okay. I I know what the problem is. Okay. My bad. Totally. My bad. My bad. Okay. Back. 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 Okay, so the problem is right here. Let me keep going back. Okay, that part is actually not bad, but there we go. There we go. Okay, that's what you meant. Yes. Okay. All right, so we are all good now. <laughs> all right. Does everybody know what... The problem was, okay, because you know, whatever is in the parentheses has to be here, and then this technically is k plus one minus one, okay. In other words, we got a k here because this is k plus one. The whole thing minus one, the minus one is coming from here, okay. So that's where, that's where I got you know tripped up myself, okay. So given that, now we can apply the assumption, f of k is k squared. So now we have 2k plus 2 minus 1, and then using algebra, it becomes 2k squared plus 2k plus 1, because 2 minus 1 is 1, and that can be rewritten as k plus 1, the whole thing squared. And that's it. This is, this is the final step to prove that um, the induction step itself can be proven. Yes? Yes. Yep. So this is the theorem. So the theorem, <clears throat> okay. So when you look at the theorem, it's not difficult to prove for very specific values of n. You can pick any one you want, right? You can say five, okay? So you look up, you look up what is f of five, and then you use the recursive definition and work it your way all the way down to f of zero, and then you back up your way. And then you go like, okay, f of 5, computationally speaking, resolves to 25. And then 25 is 5 squared. So now you have proven the theorem, but only for one specific value for n. But the theorem is not just about when n equals to 5 or when n equals to 0. It says this has to be true for every natural number n. So that is the trick, is I can, I can, I can prove it numerically for very specific values of n, but how do I know, how, how can I show that this is true for every natural number? Is that okay? So then now the trick is we use a base case. Now, do you have to use a base case of zero? No. If you feel like it, you can use a base case of f of 12 or f of 31, okay? Whatever you want to use. The problem of using 31 as your base case is now you have to go forward, like what we have here, but you also have to go backwards. Because now you have to show, oh, by the way, <clears throat> um, we can work ourselves backward, which means assume the theorem is true when n equals to k, but then you have to say prove that the theorem is also true when n equals to k minus one. Now the algebra is gonna work out just fine, but why do you want to have twice the amount of work 
when you don't have to. So that's why we chose zero as our base case, because zero is a natural starting point for natural numbers. There are no natural values smaller than zero, so it works out. Now, if you have integers, then it gets a little bit difficult, because when you have integers, then there's no natural point to start, because you know, natural, because all in, if whatever integer you choose as your base case, you can always go positive, you can always go, always go negative. So in that case, you don't have a choice but to have your know, two induction steps, one to go forward and one to go backwards. But when we use natural numbers, then we have a natural starting point and we only have to go in one direction. <clears throat> so are we doing okay so far with this one? Do you guys want me to go for another one? Okay, okay, I can give you another one that's kind of obvious too. So it's not about, the algebra is not the key, okay? You know, I, I'm not gonna test you guys on something that's really, really difficult to solve algebra. I mean, in this class, if you think your know, binomial, you know, uh, binomial expressions is difficult, <laughs> then you might not have met the prerequisite requirement for this class, which is pre-calc. Does that make sense? Okay, okay, so same thing, okay, so we are defining f of zero to be one this time. f of n is f of n minus one plus f of n minus one, okay? So once again, it is a recursive definition. Are you guys noticing that proof by induction and recursive definition kind of goes hand in hand? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so what is the theorem? This is not the theorem, these are definitions. So these are definitions of F, okay? So the theorem is for all N as a natural number, F of N is really just two to the power of N. That is the theorem. Are we good so far? Does everybody understand what the theorem is trying to say? Okay, so you can you can show you can just you know follow the computational definition and say okay let's find out what is f of three f of three is two of f of two f of two is two of f of one f of one is two of f of zero f of zero itself is one and then work your way back and go like oh okay so f of three really is eight which is also two to the power of three but guess what in that case you have only shown that the theorem is true when n equals to three. What about when n equals to 16? Ah, okay, we have to do the whole thing again. So now the question is, how do we use proof by, the proof by induction to show that the theorem is true no matter what n you choose? As long as n is a natural number, it's gonna work. Okay, same steps, okay? So the first thing we do is a base case. So since we're, dealing, we're still be dealing with natural numbers, so in the case of a base case, it kind of makes sense to say that prove that the theorem is true when n equals to zero. Okay, all right. So f of zero by definition is one, but one can also be rewritten as two to the power of zero. So now we can establish this equals to that which is exactly what the theorem is trying to say, but only for the case when n equals to zero. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's our base case. So now we look at the induction step. Induction step. <clears throat> so the induction step has two steps, okay, has two subparts. The first part is to say, assume the theorem is true for some n equals to k, okay? Then you go, go like, what k are we talking about? It doesn't matter, okay? We just say that there's one magical k where the theorem is true when n equals to that k. The second step of the induction step is to say prove that the theorem is true for the case when n equals to k plus one. 
So it's always just plus one. You cannot skip numbers. Okay, it has to be just the next sequence, uh, the next in the sequence. All right. So how do we how do we do that? Well, we're gonna we're gonna start with f of k plus one. Okay, because eventually we want to say blah 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 blah, and then down here we want to somehow show that this is k plus one. That is what we want to do. The question is, what do we do in between? To establish the equality between f of k plus one and two to the power of k plus one, so I know you guys are cannot see the entire thing. Let me move. <clears throat> cannot. I cannot do this. Oh. Okay. Hmm. That won't work either. Ah. Uh, okay. I can just kind of grab this and move it up a little bit so you guys can see it. Nope. Do it one more time. There we go. Now we can see it. Okay. So now the question is, what do we do in between to link f of k plus one all the way to two to the power of k plus one? This one is pretty easy. It's all it's it's boiling down to algebra again. But the magical step once again is first to use the definition to say that f of k plus one by definition is f of k plus f of k. And that is that has to do with how f is defined. Is that okay? So the challenge is not about the definition of f. That is fine. That is a given. We don't ask why. The challenge is: is f of n two to the power of n? That is the challenge. Can we establish that? So this part here is not a big thing. It's just by definition. So now we use the assumption. Okay, what assumption are we talking about? That the theorem is true for n equals to k, so that means f of k is two to the power of k. So now we say, okay, well, using the, the using the assumption, this is two to the power of k. This is also two to the power of k. Is that part okay? This is the magical step. Okay, is that we are using the assumption to as the missing step. Okay, that is linking where we start with f of k plus one. Eventually, to to the power two to the power two to the power of k plus one. So now we can say, okay, this is two times two to the power of k, which is two to the power of k plus one. So the rest is really just relatively relatively simple algebra, but the magical step is the assumption and how we apply the assumption and utilizing the recursive definition of f. Are we doing okay? This is proof by induction. <clears throat> so I, I just presented two relatively simple um, examples of proof by induction. If you want a complicated one, go to the proof of the binomial theorem, <laughs> because that is the <coughs> that's the reason why we talked about proof by induction. All right. So now the question is. What do you think are your chances of needing to use proof by induction sometime in your four-year university experience as a computer science major? <laughs> <clears throat> I wouldn't keep that hope up <laughs> because there are multiple classes that you that will rely on proof by induction to prove theorems. Um, there's one class called I talked about this already. It's called、um, the analysis of algorithms. So proof by induction can be useful in multiple ways in that class. The first one is time complexity. The second one is the correctness of the algorithm. Okay, you go like, what do you mean by correctness of the algorithm? Look at the definition of f here. How much work do you think I have to put in to turn this definition of f? Into a function in let's say C. Okay, let me let me let, let me ask that question in a different way. How long would it take you to implement F as defined here as a C function, or pick your favorite language, Java, JavaScript, whatever? Thirty seconds, ten seconds, five seconds. Something like that, okay. 
All right, I can show you. Unsigned, f of unsigned, and <clears throat> return um, n equals to zero. Question mark one colon f of n minus one plus f of n minus one semicolon close curly brace. Yes, that was probably about what. 40 seconds or so, but most of that has to do with, I'm handwriting. <laughs> okay, can this be considered an algorithm? It is an algorithm, okay? It's a very simple algorithm, but it is algorithm. It's, it's code, okay? This is plain C. It is code. It is an algorithm. So what we have done is I have just proven that if I claim that f of n is computing 2 to the power of n, this is the proof. I have proven the return value of this function f is indeed 2 to the power of n. That's a proof, okay? Now, is it a very simple proof? Yes. Is this a really simple algorithm? Yes. But does it make use of proof by induction? Yes, it does. Are we okay so far? All right, and a lot of algorithms, a lot of the more complex algorithms are specified in a recursive way because of this reason. Because you can now say, okay, what is the base case? Okay, when do we stop the recursion? Okay, the base case is this, and it's pretty easy to prove the theorem for the base case. Now you can work on the recursive case, and you, you can use you know, the technique of proof by induction in this case to prove the correctness of a lot of algorithms. What about time complexity? What is the time complexity of this particular definition of f? So that when we talk about time complexity, it, you have to basically say the time complexity relative to, in this case, the value of n. So now the question is, what kind of time complexity are we talking about here? Okay. How would you analyze that problem? So if I claim that the time complexity is 2 to the power of n, how would you prove it? So what I'm trying to do is to see if you guys can apply what we have just learned to say, okay, we are shifting our attention. I don't care about the correctness anymore. I'm looking into the time complexity. If I want to figure out f of 2 versus f of 3, how does the time, the amount of time relate between those two function calls? And I claim that it is 2 to the power of n. How do we prove it? So once again, the base case is when n equals to 0, how long would it take you to compute 1 as a constant? Constant time, okay? Because 1 is a constant, you don't need you, you need a fixed amount of time to compute the value of one. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> but in the recursive call, we have f of n minus one. So once again, this is a recursive definition, but the time complexity is recursive as well. Because whatever f of n minus one takes, I need twice of that much time in order to compute f of n. So the, the structure of the proof is identical to what we are seeing here, but this proof is showing that the return value of f of n is two to the power of n, but in, the, in an alternative form, you can also use the same technique to prove that the time complexity is also two to the power of n. Is that okay? <clears throat> if you want something that is less obvious when it comes to the time complexity, think about the Tower of Hanoi. How many people know what is the Tower of Hanoi problem and the solution to that? Okay, so most people know. Okay, so let's take a look at that one. <clears throat> we are closing to the end of the, the lecture, but I, I want to mention this because it is related to all this topic here, especially you know, how this is going to be applied when you are on you know, the other classes at a four-year university. So the Tower of Hanoi looks like this. Hanoi. You have three poles, okay? So you have, you know, um, I'm just gonna use um, left, mid, right, okay? 
And then you also have n, which is unsigned because it's uh, a natural number. Okay. So when in a Tau of Hanoi problem, what is the base case? When can you say, oh, I know exactly how to do this? So look at all the parameters here. Which one can tell you whether you need to do it recursively or, oh, we know this, we know the answer to that. Yep. Uh, yep. So we say when n equals one, you know, then we know what to do. So what do we do? Well, it's, it's easy. Um, okay, I should not have named it L, M, and R. So I should have named it as from via to. So the idea is you have to start with the from pole. You want to move everything to the to pole, but you can use the via pole you know, for clinical as a buffer. Okay. So when it is like this, we can just say print F. Okay. Move one disk from percent D to percent D. And that disk is going to be, I mean, the uh, from two would be the parameters of printf. Because in this case, I only got one disk, right? So I can always move that one disk from one pole to another pole. It's not going to be complicated. So now the case is, the other case is recursive. The recursive case is when n is greater than one, okay? So when, e when n equals to zero, you, know, you also don't have anything to do. So let's catch that one too. So when n equals to zero, <clears throat> And you say print f, print f. I have nothing to do. <laughs> Done. Okay. So now I have kept, I, I've been catching all the cases. So now the question is, what if n is greater than one? What do we do? Then you're going to say, let's call annoyed recursively. So what you would be doing is you are going to move the top n minus one disks from the from pole using the two as a via and then to the via pole. And that's going to be n minus one here. And after that, you can say, you know, Hanoi, okay, you can use Hanoi, you can just do a printout, it's up to you. Um, because in this case, you have one disk left from the from pole. So now we can say from via to with only one single disk. But at this point, your via pole is going to have a bunch of stuff on it. So it is time to move all that stuff to the two pole using the original from pole as a via. So now you say for via uh, uh, Hanoi. Um, this time you're going from via. This is where everything is buffered up. Using the from pole as the via and then using the two pole as the actual destination. And there should be n minus one of those. So that is the Tau of Hanoi algorithm. Pretty sure this one works, okay? So if you want to verify the time complexity, what do you do? You have two base cases. One base case is when n equals to zero, printf is constant time. Okay, that's easy. The second base case is when n equals to one, just a printf, constant time, not a problem. Is that okay? <clears throat> so now you look at the other case, which is the recursive case. So the theorem has to say the time complexity is two to the power of n. Okay, so that is the theorem. Is tower of Hanoi has a time complexity that is two to the power of n. So now what do you do? Prove by induction. Because your, your induction step is gonna say, let's assume the theorem is true for some n equals to k, and then you have to prove that the time complexity of Hanoi k plus one, okay, k plus one disks is going to be twice of that. So where's the twice coming from? This and this. They have the same time complexity, and then the induction step, the induction assumption is going to tell you that, yep, this is going to take two to the power of n minus one as a time complexity. This is also going to be two to the power of n minus one as a complexity. This one is constant time because we already showed that this is constant time. So that's how you can prove that the time complexity of the tau of Hanoi is also two to the power of n. So now you can start, to, I, I'm hoping that you start to see, even if you don't understand 100% of the technique you know, of proof by induction, because you know, it has been a while since we last mentioned it, 
the application is very important. Okay, it is is a very useful proof technique because we can express anything using a loop, using recursion. So that means you know it's a universal way of proving stuff because anything that can be done in the loop can also be expressed recursively. So we are running out of time. I'm not going to keep you guys here for too long and have a nice weekend. On next Monday, we, conti we will continue with the practice test. And I'm going to send it to all of you too so you can have the weekend to kind of look over the questions and kind of do a little bit of studying and see if you have any questions to bring back on next Monday and Wednesday. All right. Let me stop the recorder.